<laughs> Thank you. Uh, Hank Williams had a short life. He only lived to be 29. He died in 1953. He had a short recording career that only lasted for six years. But people have been listening to him and thinking about him and writing on him ever since. And that's where we got the material for the Hank Williams Reader. My two co-editors and I, Pat Huber and Dave Anderson, we went over hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of writings about Hank in the, from the time of his career on up till recently in newspapers and news magazines and fan magazines and autobiographies of family members and band members and scholarly works, just a whole host of different types of writing. And we chose what we thought were the most significant, the most interesting, the most revealing of those writings. And we include about 70 of them in the Hank Williams Reader that were published. The earliest one is 1947, when he, just before he hit it big nationally. And the most recent piece we include is from 2011. So they cover decades of the best writing about Hank Williams. And what I want to do today is read excerpts from some of these readings that I think are the best and the most interesting and share different aspects of Hank Williams as seen through his eyes and through the eyes of newspaper reporters and journalists and critics and family members, a variety of people. And this first uh, excerpt is from an article called Because Hank is Moving On, Move It On Over Big Time, which appeared in the Montgomery Advertiser in 1948 before he had become a national star, but he was very big locally. And at one point in the article, he said, well, just lately, Hank said, somebody got the idea nobody didn't listen to my kind of music. I told everybody on the radio that this was my last program. If anybody's enjoyed it, I said, I'd like to hear from them. I got 400 cards and letters that afternoon and the next morning. They decided they wanted to keep my kind of music. But shows a little bit of the cockiness that Hank Williams was known for sometimes. He didn't do many interviews. The hillbilly stars, as they were called at the time, just there wasn't that much demand to interview them. And so there aren't that many interviews surviving, and the ones that survive aren't very long. But we found one that we thought was pretty revealing from 1951 in a newspaper that we haven't been able to identify. We don't know what newspaper it was in. We think it was probably South Carolina. But it's the article titled Gold in Them Hillbillies. And from the language of the article, you can tell that the author didn't take Hank entirely seriously, but it has some good quotes from Hank in it. So let me read a little bit from that article. A tall, hollow-cheeked hillbilly drew one lanky leg over the other in a comfortable position and drawled, sure, plenty of people make fun of me, but I just ignore them. I figure they're ignorant and don't know any better. <laughs> Hank Williams, $100,000 a year folk singer who says he began by playing every one-room schoolhouse and pig path in the state of Alabama, launched into an impassioned defense of his profession. The way I feel, he said, is if you don't like folk music, stay away from my shows. Personally, I can't stand classical stuff, but I don't tell the world about it. I just turn the radio off. Now, why can't these folks just do the same who don't like my kind of music? He shook his head. When they start making fun of me, I don't even answer them. And when these wise guys come just to whoop and holler and cut up, I tell them to get out. They're plain ignorant. With an air of meekness and long suffering, Hank told about the price a humble man of the hills pays for successfully courting a backwoods muse. It's my fans, he confided. You see, in this business, if you're a success, there's some folks who actually worship you. I've been to some places where it's impossible to walk across the stage without having the major portion of my outfit torn off for souvenirs. They even, he added, rubbing his thinning mass of crowning glory, grab fistfuls of hair. <laughs> Those who don't carry Hank away in little pieces write letters. When you get to be a big success, Hank said, folks have a way of writing you and telling you their troubles, all kinds of troubles. If their husband dies and they're left with eight starving kids, they write. And if their sweetheart done them wrong, they write. And if they feel sort of blue, they write. I don't know, Hank sighed and gave a puzzled shrug. I reckon they think I'm something like the Red Cross. <laughs> his most famous interview, his most famous comments about country music were published in the magazine Nation's Business after he died. He did this interview shortly before his death. And he talks about country music here. He says, you ask what makes our kind of music successful. I'll tell you. It can be explained in just one word, sincerity. When a hillbilly sings a crazy song, he feels crazy. When he sings, I laid my mother away, he sees her laying there right there in the coffin. He sings more sincere than most entertainers because the hillbilly was raised rougher than most entertainers. You got to know a lot about hard work. 
you got to have smelt a lot of mule manure before you can sing like a hillbilly. <laughs> the people who has been raised something like the way the hillbilly has knows what he is singing about and appreciates it. For what he is singing is the hopes and prayers and dreams and experiences of what some people call the common people. I call them the best people because they are the ones that the world is made up most of. They're really the ones that make things tick wherever they are in this country or in any country. They're the ones who understand what we're singing about, and that's why our kind of music is sweeping the world. There ain't nothing strange about our popularity these days. It's just there are more people who like us than there are the educated, cultured kind. In December of 1951, Hank had to have major back surgery and had an enforced break from touring after that. But by the end of January 1952, he was headed off on tour again, and his first stop was in Richmond, Virginia at the Mosque Theater. And unfortunately, he showed up there intoxicated, unable to perform. And unfortunately for him, a reporter for the Richmond Times named Edith Lindman was there to cover the show. And this is the only example we found of an account of Hank on stage at his worst during his lifetime. So I'll read a little of that. After the intermission, Ray Price and his boys came back. Ray Price was another country star just starting out who had covered while Hank was backstage getting in shape to perform. They sang and played and ad-libbed and whipped up extra numbers. Half the audience applauded their stalwart efforts to keep the show going. The other half yelled for Hank to come back. Presently, Price was called off stage. When he came back, he said, the situation seems a lot improved and introduced Hank to the crowd again. This time his spine seemed to feel better. The audience greeted him with laughs and a few boos, to which he answered, I wish I was in as good a shape as you are. Then he looked around and said, Hank Williams is a lot of things, but he ain't a liar. If there's a doctor in the house, I'll show him I've been in the hospital for eight weeks, and this is my first show since then. And if you ain't nice to me, I'll turn around and walk right off. Price, who deserves some special place in hillbilly heaven after his stint last night, jumped in and said, we all love you, Hank, don't we, folks? And the audience applauded and laughed. Then Hank sang Move It On Over, and it sounded pretty good, almost as good as one of his records after it has been played a few hundred times. <laughs> he also introduced the instrumentalists all over again and sang I Can't Help It. As a finish, he sang Cold, Cold Heart once more, remembering all the words. Then he walked out and got in his big yellow automobile with a chauffeur to drive him home. And Hank played a show in the same theater the next night, and Hank Williams' lore has it that he dedicated a song to a gracious lady writer, and the song was Mind Your Own Business. <laughs> <laughs> Hank had a famously tumultuous relationship with his wife, Audrey, and by the spring of 1952, she decided she wanted out of the marriage. So here's a segment from the bill of complaint that she filed in court as part of the divorce proceedings. The foregoing specific instances are but samples of the cruel and inhuman treatment which has been inflicted upon the complainant, Audrey, by defendant, Hank, at numerous times and practically throughout their entire married life, the degree and extent thereof having become more intense within this past several months, to the point that even though complainant has every desire to maintain the home of the parties and to preserve this marriage, she is not physically or mentally able further to endure this mistreatment. Defendant is a man of violent disposition when aroused, and this violence is particularly aggravated when the complainant, herself, is the object thereof. As has been demonstrated in the past, the defendant does not hesitate to make a physical attack upon the complainant. She is desperately afraid that when this bill is served upon him, he, if not prevented by the process of this court, will inflict more grievous and serious bodily injury and harm upon her than ever before. Now, Audrey was nothing if not flexible, and a year later, and a couple of weeks after Hank had died, there was an as told to article in the Montgomery Advertiser in which she described very different memories of her relationship with Hank. She said, I felt the night I met Hank that all my dreams had come true, and I realized it more and more as our courtship continued. Even after marriage and through difficult times, it kept pulling me back to him when other senses told me to stay away. The dream was good, it was true. Everything I ever wanted or could desire, I found in Hank Williams. The heights of joy could not be told or even imagined of the happiness I have known as his wife. She never mentioned that they were actually divorced at this time, <laughs> time he died. Nothing can ever take that away from me. Since he is gone, his memory is still like the beautiful dream he made come true for me. I will try to carry on where he left off. The world of music was his. I am making it mine. My band will be called the Drifting Cowgirls in memory of the Drifting Cowboys. And I will try to find happiness in the world in which he found it and gave it to me. 
Uh, in the wake of Hank's death, some of the most poignant writing was in the form of letters that fans wrote into newspapers. And I want to read one of those to you, written by two teenagers who wrote the Nashville Tennessean uh, a couple of days after Hank died. A thick fog of rain settled around our house in the early morning hours. No one expected to hear that Hank Williams, the beloved country songwriter and singer, had suddenly passed away on New Year's Day. We listened to the sad news and prayed that it was all a mistake, Hank, but there comes a time when reality tells us that our fears are real, and that's when we face the truth. There was no mistake. Our beloved Hank was dead. There were tears in our eyes as we got ready for school, Hank. We didn't want to talk about it, but occasionally one of us would look at the other and say, I wish it wasn't true. At school, we went to our classes as usual and recited our lessons, but when we looked across the aisle at a schoolmate, there was a sad expression on his face, and we knew he was mourning for you, Hank. Yes, Hank, America is mourning for you. We loved you and your ever-popular songs. We looked at the papers when they arrived at school, Hank, and there was the sad story of your death. We cut out the story and carefully placed it in our book, so when we went home, we could paste it in our scrapbook to keep forever. In assembly, we bowed our heads and prayed silently, Dear God, please bless Hank Williams. Please take him to heaven with you, O Lord, where he will be happy in the mansion, his mansion of gold. We have lost one of the best singers and songwriters in the world, but we'll meet him in heaven someday. Amen. As we worked in the school cafeteria, we sang, I've got a mansion just over the hilltop as a memorial to you, Hank. We know you've got a mansion in heaven and that you've gone from us to live in that mansion, and we pray that you will be very happy in your new home. We read in the paper that you were the most lonesome, the saddest, most tortured and frustrated person that ever lived. Oh, Hank, why were you so lonesome and lost? As this dark, dreary day comes to a close, we shall close our message to you. Even though we never saw you in person, we loved you, Hank. And it's signed, Retha Mae Brewer, 19, Nettie Jean Brewer, 14, from Hohenwald, Tennessee. Near the end of his life, the last fall of his life, Hank began employing a supposed doctor. It turns out he bought his diploma in the mail, but he claimed that he could treat alcoholism and could uh, help Hank get over that. But in actuality, the doctor named Toby Marshall ended up supplying Hank with drugs that probably ended up help, helping to kill him. In 1952, uh, I'm sorry, 1953, Marshall was questioned by the Oklahoma State Legislature and a committee that was investigating the illegal narcotics trade. And this March 1953 newspaper article discusses a, Marsh a letter that Marshall wrote to his parole officer. He thought Hank might have committed suicide. Marshall's letter, written to Campbell LaFleur, pardon and parole officer, January 7th, was disclosed by LaFleur Wednesday following testimony by Williams' widow before a legislative narcotics investigating committee Tuesday night. Marshall's letter reads, Although he, Hank Williams, had a multiplicity of emotional problems, basically he was a very lonely person and couldn't stand being alone. This was expressed in his music. This in spite of the fact he had a host of fair weather friends, most of whom were parasites who fawned on him, played up to him, kept him supplied with liquor and women, and usually wound up by getting to him for a chunk of money. He informed me that his second wife, Billie Jean, was really taking him to the cleaners. Marshall added, now it occurs to me that perhaps Hank got to mulling things over in his mind and having a very persuasive personality, he might just have talked the doctor in Na Knoxville out of enough stuff, barbiturates, to kick himself off. The letter was filled with information which the committee, headed by Representative Robert O. Cunningham, has struggled to extract from Marshall in a number of hearings. He will be held in Oklahoma County Jail until the committee is through with him, then he will be remanded to the state penitentiary to serve out his two-year forgery term. He told a story of a gradual decay on the part of his patient, Williams, whom he accompanied on several personal appearance tours. I can't overlook the fact that he had been on a rapid decline. Most of his bookings were of the honky-tonk beer joint variety that he simply hated. If he came to the conclu this conclusion, suicide, he still had enough prestige left as a star to make a first-class production of it. Whereas six months from now, unless he pulled himself back up into some high-class bookings, he might have been playing for nickels and dimes on Skid Row. Now that kind of news coverage uh, helped inspire a series of sensationalistic articles that appeared in cheap tabloid magazines in the mid-1950s purporting to reveal the real Hank Williams, the behind-the-scenes story. And one of the chief keepers of Hank's flame over the decades after his death was his sister Irene. 
and she wrote a column for the magazine Country Song Roundup in 1957 in which she defended her brother. There's one question that I've been asked so often that I feel I owe, you, owe it to you all to answer it. Are all the things that are being written about Hank true? No, they could not possibly be. To have done all the things that he has been accused of doing, Hank would have had to have lived 100 years, and I doubt that even then he would have been able to do it all. Let's face it, for a long time, Hank's name has been news. Anything that had his name to it was inter has interested you readers, and you have bought the magazines bearing stories about him. Many of these writers have written about Hank without having ever tried to find out the truth about him or his life. They have taken one incident that they have heard about and have blown it up as though this was his whole life. Yes, Hank drank, but he did not spend his whole life drunk. He was in terrible pain the last two years of his life and was given sedatives by the doctors for this pain. But Hank was not a dope addict, and as far as I know, he never pitched a wild dope party in his life. Basically, Hank was a clean, honest man. He tried to do unto others the way he would have them do unto him more than any person I've ever met. I only wish there were more Hank Williamses in this world. Frankly, I think that it would be just a little bit better place in which to live. Perhaps you will say, and naturally so, that after all, I am his sister. But if you will listen to his music, you will get to know the real Hank Williams, and you won't find him to be the kind of person these people are writing about. In April of 1952, a music critic and uh, journalist named Ralph Gleason interviewed Hank when Hank was on a West Coast tour and published the results in the San Francisco Chronicle. And then 17 years later, Gleason revisited that article and a concert he had attended at the same time to write a new article for Rolling Stone magazine, which Gleason had helped found. And the article was titled, Hank Williams, Roy Acuff, and then God. And here's part of that 1969 article. And he had that thing. He made them scream when he sang, and that audience was shipped right up from Enid or Wichita Falls intact, like Elia Kazan shipped the bit players for Baby Doll up from the deep south to Long Island for a scene. There were lots of those blondes you see at country and western affairs, the kind of hair that mother never had and nature never grew, and the tight skirts that won't quit, and the guys looking barbershop neat but still with a touch of dust on them. Some great people came through to play for them, and this time it was Hank Williams and the Drifting Cowboys, it said, but I believe now, as I suspected then, that the only Drifting Cowboy was Hank. At the intermission, it was impossible to talk to him. He was a little stoned and didn't seem to remember our conversation earlier in the day, and the party was beginning to get a little rough. They were whiskey drinkers, so I gave them room, looked around a while, and then went on back out. Six months later, when I read he had died, I remembered him saying in that Oakland Hotel coffee shop how much he loved his Tennessee ranch, but how little time he got to spend there because he was on the road so much. Last time I was there, it rained, he said sourly. And then he added that he was stocking the ranch with cattle, and his ambition someday was to retire there and watch, quote, them cattle work while I write songs and fish. He never did, of course. I had no idea how tortured a man he was when I saw him. It came through more in his performances. He didn't cry, but he could make you cry. And when he sang Love Sick Blues, you knew he meant it. So he died in the back seat of a car en route from one gig to another, from one ratty dance hall to another ratty dance hall, while the world gradually came to sing his songs and his Hollywoodized life was shown and re-shown on late night TV and the court fights for his estate went on for years. Still goes on, I think, that legal fight, like some ghost walking the pine hills for eternity. When Irene Williams Smith, his sister, wrote that piece defending him, I read just now, it was mid-50s, and she was a respected real estate agent and civic leader in Dallas. But I'm about to read from a piece that she wrote from a federal prison in West Virginia <laughs> after she was arrested attempting to smuggle $7 million of cocaine across the Mexico-US border at the behest of her then boyfriend. Even from prison, though, she remained staunch, a staunch defender of her brother. In 1961, my husband and I were divorced. After our divorce, I became more and more interested in psychic phenomena. I joined a group that met weekly to discuss the different psychic sciences. In the spring of 1969, a couple of friends dropped by one evening to discuss psychic phenomena. During the course of the evening, my friends decided to set up the Ouija board they had brought with them. They began to get messages almost immediately. One of the spirits contacted told them that Hank was there and wanted to talk with me. 
For the next 45 minutes, I asked questions and wrote them down along with the answers. We discussed a man with whom I was deeply in love. Hank told me that he was no good for me and that to continue our relationship could only end in disaster for me. Two months later, I attended two seances where once again Hank spoke with me through the medium conducting the seance. Both times he begged me to forget the man I loved. He went on to tell me that even though I had neither seen nor heard from him, the man, in several months, that I would hear from him soon and he would invite me to join him in Mexico. Hank warned me not to go to Mexico, whatever I did. Both seances were recorded by friends in Dallas. I was deeply in love when the call came less than two months later. I left immediately to join the man I loved in Mexico. Most of you know the rest of the story. All I can say is that no one would have understood better than Hank. Despite his warning, love is eternal, and if you truly love, you go when called. Less than a month after I left for Mexico, I was arrested in Laredo, Texas. For the past two years, I have been an inmate in the Federal Reformatory for Women at Alderson, West Virginia, just a few miles from where Hank was found dead in the back seat of his car in the early hours of January 1st, 1953. After his divorce from Audrey in October of 1952, Hank had married his second wife, 20-year-old Louisianan Billie Jean Jones. And she wrote an article many years later called Fear and Loathing at Hank's Funeral, where she describes the tensions that crackled through Hank's mother's house in the days preceding the singer's funeral. I'll read a little bit of that. Now that Audrey is dead of natural causes, only time will tell which turn Randall Jr., Hank Jr.'s, mind will take. Junior had all the strikes against him, being raised by a domineering mother like Audrey, who wanted fame for Junior too, with the fortune that goes with it. But she ended up losing both. She died in hock to the IRS and deserted by Junior, who had gone through two wives himself. In self-defense, Junior had moved to Alabama. Surely by now he must know why Hank Sr. was running. You can never keep up with what you're supposed to be. Audrey is better off. She couldn't have faced old age, and time takes its toll with all of us. I can't complain. I've just kept on hooking it. When my time's up, I hope I'm backstage somewhere listening to Willie Nelson singing Amazing Grace. While Hank's body lay in state for all the cameras to view in his mother's living room, she and I were fighting with fists in the bathroom and elsewhere. She was so big, a good six foot and no less than 250 pounds, I had to get up on the commode to slap her. <laughs> but my daddy had taught me in the South that they was never too big. I guess I believed him since I haven't changed yet. A, uh, another interesting perspective on Hank's mother came secondhand from comedian Minnie Pearl, who was maybe the nearest thing to a close friend that Hank had among his fellow performers. And she wrote this in her autobiography. Hank once made the most incredible remark I've ever heard anyone make about their mother. He told us he used to get into a lot of honky-tonk brawls when he was still a kid living at home. One night, a guy beat him up so badly he was left for dead in a roadhouse parking lot. A cab driver had been called by someone else, and when he pulled in to pick up his fare, it, the headlights hit Hank, lying there unconscious in a pool of blood. The cabbie recognized him and took him, took him home to his mother. She looked at his wounds, then said, first we get you sewed up, then we go get him. <laughs> Hank said, Minnie, there ain't anybody in the world I'd rather have alongside me in a fight than my mama with a broken beer bottle in her hand. <laughs> He said it as though it was nothing out of the ordinary at all. <laughs> Rick Bragg is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist from Alabama uh, who's published a number of acclaimed books. First one was All Over But the Shoutin' you may be familiar with. And he wrote a foreword to a 2001 book made up of photographs of Hank Williams called Snapshots from the Lost Highway. So I want to read a little bit of the foreword that Bragg wrote. Like most people who sing something so true that it makes us cry, or at least makes us smile and tap our toes, he left tracks in the red dirt and black bottom land and Gulf Coast sand, and left pieces of himself in photos and scrawled out song lyrics, and faded posters of shows he performed, and some he never showed up to at all. But people still don't know him, really. They have only seen specks and glimmers and slivers, maybe because his life was so short, but more likely because that is about all he left, lets us see. Even the very old, the ones who were alive when he sang his music at country fairs, who filled auditoriums in Montgomery and Bossier City, know little more about him than those of us who knew his music from hearing our mamas sing his words over dishpans. Dish 
And we, in turn, know only a little more than the ones who came after us, who heard his words for the first time on gleaming compact discs that have had the scratches magically lifted away. So we are hungry for the details, for insights, maybe even for answers to why he was able to bend us the way he did and why he did not last. We want to know little things as much as momentous things. I guess we just want to know, period. And then finally, the last thing I'd like to read is one of the shortest selections in The Reader, but it's, I think it's also one of the most powerful. It's an uh, editorial that appeared in the Montgomery Advertiser two days after Hank died, written by Grover Hall, Jr., the editor. In appraising the life of Hank Williams, it is unimportant whether you liked his songs, whether you're, in your opinion he created ugliness or beauty. The important thing is that he made millions of people happy, and no amount of quibbling over the artistic merit of his life's worth can erase that. That Hank had a certain order of poetic genius is attested by the legions of those to whom his songs contain truths about life. For those people, the words and music of Hank Williams were eternal verities, such as the words of Keats are to others. He was racked by physical and emotional afflictions, and these, coupled with his gift of song, made him kin to millions. He brought them relief and gaiety, and that is a blessed work in a somber world. So thank you. I can't see you, so <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, many consider Hank Williams a, a Montgomery area musician, but what, what, where would you really say he's from, or if you had to uh, tie him down to a, a place or an area, where would it be, and, and, and how would you define that? Well, South Alabama, he was born in a little community called Mount Olive, and he lived in Georgiana and Greenville before he moved to Montgomery in 1937. But he always referred to Montgomery as his hometown. And it's interesting, you can hear, there's a few taped interviews with him left, and sometimes it seems like he's always trying to turn the interview back to Montgomery. Oh yeah, I was in Montgomery recently, or I'm from Montgomery, you know, so. And that's what he considered to be his real home. Yeah, Nash, outside Nashville. So, yeah, that's where his career was peaked out. But, again, I think he st had a strong, sentimental, nostalgic connection to Montgomery and really considered it home. Mm -hmm. huh. Yeah, uh, a friend of mine, Joe Asbell, uh, covered the funeral for the Montgomery Advertiser and wrote a, a big story in there. I see you got it in the book. Mm -hmm. I just wonder why you didn't comment on that. <laughs> <laughs> well, like I said, we had 70 pieces, and, the, and I'd have been happy to read them all, but I don't know if you'd have stuck with me <laughs> for the whole time. Joe Asbell, I think, he might have, we've got one piece he wrote in the 1960s about Hank's grave and how he thought that the city should build some kind of museum that so many tourists came to see the grave that if the city was willing to make more of Hank Williams, which it wasn't at the time, that it could draw additional people. And I know, I think we included that. And then, I can't remember if we included the uh, piece where he talked about almost being fired for his coverage of the funeral, because when the front page was being laid out, whoever was laying out the first page asked how much to devote to Hank Williams' funeral. And the funeral was just huge beyond all expectations. 15 to 20,000 or more people came to Montgomery outside the city auditorium for the funeral. And it really surprised a lot of people who hadn't really understood how popular he was and what his music meant to people. So Joe Asbell said that when he was asked how much of the front page to use, he said, use all of it. And I don't think they ended up using all of it, but they used a big chunk of it. And then he was called into the boss's office the next week, and the boss had thought he had ruined the newspaper. But before he could be fired or verbally abused, the circulation person says that, the, man, these are selling like hotcakes. People are call, writing in, calling in, they want more copies of this paper. So the way Asbel said, tells the story, he was uh, saved by the fact that so many people were interested in that front page story.
Okay. <laughs> so he told us to meet him in front of the Jeff Davis Hotel. And that uh, he would take us up to his apartment, which was two stories behind the hotel there. And he listened to us sing. And he was so nice to us. He uh, gave us a few licks on the guitar that he thought would help. And uh, suggested a few things, and we sang where the soul of man never died. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, that I think, uh, sometimes people who write about Hank Williams, and some of that was indicated in what I covered today, there really was a dark, grim, disturbing side to him, and that's one reason he died so young, and he had a lot of unhappiness and a lot of misery and addiction and that kind of thing, but he wasn't all that way. I mean, he had a really sparkling sense of humor when he was on, and there's lots of stories of him being really kind to people in different situations here and elsewhere, so sometimes people paint it as all dark when that, that wasn't the case. I've spoken to several now. I'm, uh, I've spoken with several members of his band, and I get a big kick out of it. They will defend him to the death that he was not an alcoholic. Uh, I remember one the guy said, I ain't one no alcoholic, he just like to get drunk. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Um, Something has been written about uh, the African American blues tradition and its influence on Hank Williams. I know there are references to a musician that he knew named T. Tot, which uh, is that is that largely apocryphal? Of, uh, and that that's one of my questions. Is there any is there documentation of his influence by that source? And, um, secondly, in, in your opinion, uh, does, does he sound to you like he was influenced by that time? Well, T-Tot, his real name was Rufus Payne, and he's, he's definitely real. When Hank was growing up in South Alabama, he paid for lessons from T-Tot, followed him around, so he learned a lot about playing the guitar and performance from him. And there's this poignant story of after he got to be really famous, Hank Williams came back to Alabama for a tour. It may have been for Hank Williams Day they had in Greenville, and he wanted to find T-Tot, but by that point he didn't realize it, but T-Tot was dead, and it's buried here in Montgomery in an unmarked grave, I think, but there's a monument in front of the cemetery. And he was very open about crediting him. There's a newspaper interview where he said that all he had ever learned about music was from this black musician in South Alabama. So that's definitely true. And I think he was influenced by that blues tradition. Some people see him as the greatest white blues singer. So that definitely, I think a lot of great singers soak up a lot of influences and kind of synthesize those. And I think he was one who did that and, and the blues played a role in that. I think we have a question. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, this is a question about the lyrics of his songs. I wonder if the book includes some of the lyrics and how many of the songs that Hank Williams sang did he write himself? He wrote a really high percentage of his own songs. That was one of the things that people, even people in the music business magazines like Billboard, they were fascinated with Hank Williams because he was so successful writing his own songs and because he was the first country singer who consistently wrote songs that pop singers like Tony Bennett and Rosemary Clooney would then have hits with. I mean, Tony Bennett's second number one hit was Cold, Cold Heart, 
which he didn't want to record initially. He told Mitch Miller, who wanted him to record it, don't make me sing cowboy songs. But then it turned out to be a huge hit for him, and a lot of pop artists recorded his songs. So most of his songs he, he wrote. There are hits that he had. Ironically, the biggest hit he ever had, the one that launched him to national fame, Love Sick Blues, he didn't write. That had been written back in the 1920s by two Tin Pan Alley songwriters who had nothing to do with country music. And there's a few other hits, half as much he didn't write, Take These Chains From My Heart, but most of the songs he had hits with, he wrote himself. And was there a second part to the question? Uh, well, does the book include... Oh, there are a few lyrics included, if they're included in one of the articles that we carried, but I know from another publication on Hank Williams, I wrote a chapter that was published in a book last year on country music lyricists. And when you use the lyrics to the songs, the company that owns the publishing rights, they want to be paid for those songs. So I think it cost $300 for me to quote some of his songs in that uh, article. So if for nothing else, it's, it's not financially not a good idea to include a lot of lyrics. In it. But when the author we excerpted has lyrics, then they're in there. But we don't have anything focusing specifically on them ourselves. Uh -huh. Uh, Elvis was just right around the corner when he died, just a year or two later. What would have happened to Hank Williams if he had survived and maybe straightened out in the 1950s when all music changed? We in history call that a counterfactual question that you can't really answer. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I mean, it's, it's hard to tell in terms, I mean, country music took a huge blow in terms of its popularity when rock and roll came out and had to adjust its style in an attempt to get a broader array of, of more adult listeners. But then I think that quote that I read is interesting from the Ralph Gleason piece where he said his ideal would be to live on a ranch and fish and write songs and let other people sing them. Because I think he had the most pride and enjoyed most writing songs. So even if his personal performing style had gone out of fashion, and, and who knows whether it would have or not, because there's a lot of charisma and dynamism that went with it, and then there's a singer like Webb Pierce, who certainly had a very uh, rural sounding tone that was very popular in the 50s. So he might have remained popular himself, but I'm pretty sure he could have written songs that other people would have recorded, whether people would have continued to buy him singing them or not. Okay, well, if that's all the questions for today, thank you very much. If anyone has a book of those questions, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>